Another slightly more complex version of stakeholder theory was introduced by Margaret Blair, and she became one of the more principal academic owners. She published a book in 1985, obviously, 1995, obviously slightly before the more popular, more public academic, semi-academic work of Will Hutton, called Ownership Control, Rethinking Corporate Governance of the 21st Century. And she was actually putting forward an idea that there was a team production theory in corporate law. The idea that actually anything that was manufactured, anything that came out of a company or a service, etc., was produced through the activities of a team and that the people who were part of that team were all entitled to an out part of the output. And that team could be more than just the people who produced it. It could be the suppliers. It could be those who made allowances for them. It could be those who granted rights to them. So that some of the productions of corporations could not be done without the rights granted by the state. So the state had certain rights in return, of course, the state itself is this representative of the people. So at that, and it was against this that she, this team production theory, went against the agency cost model. The agency cost model had dominated legal scholarship for over two deco- decades. According to the standard agency cost model, a corporation ought always be run to maximise shareholder wealth because they're the manager of the corporation were mere agents of the owners of the corporation who were the shareholders. But the stakeholder one came in and said, actually, no, this is not true. The idea that from the legal point of view, in fact, he argued that actually the laws are not as clear as you may think. Stout and Blair captured the Sloan Foundation's attention when they published an influential paper proposing a team production theory of corporate law. We proposed this model term the agency cost model. The idea, of course, was that actually, if you are going to actually function properly, if you're going to actually function legally, there is a very big argument that says that actually you are not only legally bound by the needs of your shareholders. And this has been shown, we talked about this earlier in the course, we're talking about a case in the uh, UK law, where they, uh, it was introduced, introduced by the fact that uh, Liverpool Football Club was sold against the interest of its primary shareholders because it was in the interest of the club. It was in the interest of the stakeholders of the club. Contrary properly, this was not some special law because it, Liverpool was a special case of football. It was a standard business law that said that the chairman of the company could sell it if that was in the interests of the organisation as a whole. And we had similar rulings in American law. We looked at the idea of uh, the Ford one, where actually the rulings were, all the Ford was ordered to hand over money. Many of the other rulings that he was accused of, such as things like philanthropy, etc., were not taken on board. The corporation said that actually, as the person who ran the company, he was entitled to do this. But he was all, but in that case, the verge was split in that he was ordered to pay over the money that was owing, the money that they had in the bank. So this is alternative traditional views. The argument was that the traditional view failed to protect other corporate stakeholders and any other contributors who made contributions to the film. These are people such as the managers and rank and file employees. They are saying that without these people, you could actually not succeed as a firm. Without these people, and not the ones who direct contributions, like I said, some of the others who would, by the state or by the ordinary people, would make allowances to allow you to run a factory there, allowing you maybe to do some pollution. Their interests had to be protected because they had a stake and they had made a contribution and their contribution should be rewarded. Also made the point that actually US law did not require a corporation to be run by its shareholders. They're not run directly by shareholders. It is actually requires by law that corporations are run by a board of directors. And this is the same even in shareholder value corporations like the UK. Most countries have the rule of board directors. But as you think about it, why do they have, if they're, Everything is supposed to be in the interest of the shareholders. Why do the shareholders not get to select all the board of directors? No, the law requires they are separate. This means the board is allowed, at least, and sometimes it's argued that it is required to put back, to sacrifice shareholders' profits, to sacrifice shareholder bond trusts, if they can show that this is to protect the interests of other important members of the corporate team, to protect the corporation itself. And it's argued that this isn't actually an essential, it's not an inefficient organisation, it's essential if you want other important shareholders, particularly employees, but also perhaps uh, the local authorities, perhaps the local population, perhaps suppliers, to make long-term commitments to a company. If you can say you can make a long-term commitment to the company and recognise that it's a strong company, then this is the only way of doing it. So therefore, in fact, stakeholder management is not an anti-capitalist movement. The argument is a pro-capitalist movement. And it also argues that actually most managers have very, very complex constituencies. They have to deal with a lot of people. The idea is that they are globally comparative these days, most businesses. The conception of the company as a set of relationships is very common in Europe and Asia. It's very well developed. So, in fact, the US model is, is the one that stands out as being separate, the US-UK model. 
And so we must need to look at ways of working on this that actually say, no, 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 from now on, we must actually respect more of the things. As we get more involved in international business, it becomes clear that we cannot be completely ignorant. No. But if you look at this, going back to the beginning of the course, how does this compare with Chandler? What capitalism did he define? What did Ka Chandler believe were the interests? I mean, Chandler actually did not argue for state shareholder value. He believed you would get shareholder value, but he argued that the separation of ownership control was a good thing and that people who ran companies would run them in the interest of the things. There are also elements, perhaps, of resource dependency theory and the idea of governance that takes care of employees, takes care of supplier state, and etc., and other sorts of stakeholders. This argument, uh, an ancient theory requires you to negotiate and control disparities your organization, but stakeholder theory says actually you don't need to negotiate and control them. You, if you can meet all their needs, you can align everyone's needs together, you will gain long term loyalty. This means to a growing emphasis among the corporation on things like employee relations, customer relations, supplier relations, investor relations, all of these become more and more important to the corporation.